Microsoft Ignite kicks off this week in a virtual conference. After all, they're all virtual these days. And there's a slew of announcements. And Mary Jo Foley is going to walk us through these things. Hi, Mary Jo. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Larry. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So Project Cortex is, you know, front and center, I want to say yeah. again, because I feel like I've been hearing about this for like a year or two now, maybe three yeah. even. Yeah. Um, so what are they doing there? So um, a year ago at Ignite, Microsoft really talked up Project Cortex, which is their coming knowledge management service and strategy. And they said it was going to be available as of early summer 2020, which I thought was very ambitious at the time. Um, that was even before we knew about the pandemic. So, you know, summer came and went and there was no Project Cortex. But this week at Ignite, they're going to give an update on what's happening with Cortex. And it turns out everything we thought we knew about Cortex is kind of upended and revamped. So Cortex isn't going to be this one centralized integrated service like Teams. Instead, it's going to come out as these various piece parts that are branded various ways. And the very first piece part that comes out on October 1st is called SharePoint Syntex, S-Y-N-T-E-X. So that's basically the way you automatically will tag, uh, route, store your documents that you're trying to um, use in conjunction with Cortex. So they take advantage of machine teaching technology so you can train five documents, you know, like take five invoices, train them in the system to show SharePoint how you want them handled, and then it'll take it from there and start automatically doing things like meta tagging. So it's, it's a lot of the same principles that they talked about for Cortex, but it's not going to be delivered at all in the same way that they originally talked about it. So, I mean, Cortex was this knowledge management graph thing, yeah. right? So right. it was supposed to span the whole enterprise and all this. So yep. what do they get out of breaking it up into chunks and a brand like SharePoint, which I know, you know, I know SharePoint's a huge thing, but it as is. far as branding goes, or as far as a brand goes, most people hear yeah. SharePoint and cringe a little bit, right? I there's, know, right. There's, there's a whole ecosystem just saying we're not SharePoint and that's great marketing. Um, I know. Yep. I, I was surprised they used the SharePoint brand too, but to be realistic, if you look at what Cortex was supposed to be under the covers, it really was SharePoint as your document and content management system. So, you know, they, they have a very big brand with SharePoint among people who care about content management. So in a lot of ways, I think it's not a miss to use the SharePoint branding, but I agree. It's kind of like they had this whole idea of this big new service you know, wow, big bang launch. And now here you are with a, an add-on to SharePoint that you're going to have to pay for per user um, if you have an existing Microsoft 365 license. So it's it's a kind of like a little letdown in a way, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's just a weird, you yeah. know, I don't want to portray it as a retreat. No. But it, it, Project Cortex as an overall charging service yeah. sounded way better, at least on paper. I know. And you know, they had, a, they had a number of customers in a private preview for the past several months. And my guess, I don't know this for a fact, is the customers came to them and said, guys, we can't learn one more new thing. Like, not one more new big thing. We need something that's more incremental and we can work in with our existing workflow instead of having to say to our customers, here's another new thing to learn. You know, so I, I think that's probably part of the reason they're going to break this up. And they, they have the next two pieces ready too. They said they're going to be out before the end of the year. So those topic cards that they showed uh, that would manifest themselves in things like Teams and Outlook, those are going to be delivered as a separate add-on as well. Uh, but we don't know how that's going to be branded or priced or licensed at this point, but it's coming before the end of the year, they say. Okay. And, and I assume there's a lot of Azure stuff on deck. Um, I think there's community communication services, and then there's some resiliency stuff, which, you know, yeah. Azure needs some resiliency, if you ask me. Yeah. Um, what's going on there? <laughs> yeah, so let's talk communication services first. Um, this is related also to coronavirus um, and the pandemic. Um, Microsoft's contention, which I think is correct, is that people really need more kind of hand-holding in their applications. Um, ways, because er everybody's using applications remotely now, whether it's work from home or learn from home. Um, it makes it a lot easier to use an application if you have things built into it like video chat and video calling and SMS messaging. Um, and what better way, if you're Microsoft, than to say, hey, 
here's the platform we use for teams for all of those things. We're going to make it available for you, customers and partners, if you want to integrate those things right into your own apps. So say you're, you're a business and you need video calling built into your app and you don't want to build it from scratch, you're going to be able to license Azure Communication Services from Microsoft and just have that available to you as APIs and software development kits and add it more easily right into your own app and know that it's running on Azure and it's been proven as working on Microsoft Teams. So is it is it a licensing thing or is it more like you pay per call or, you know, kind of like a metered model? Yeah, so I don't know the pricing uh, model or the licensing model for this yet. Um, I think it's just gonna be available in public preview as of this week at Ignite. Uh, but I can tell you, it must be fairly well along its way because the Dynamics team at Microsoft is uh, going to announce at the show as well that they're using the ACS platform inside one of their own apps, their own customer service app, to build out these communication capabilities that aren't in that app right now. So I think it's ready to roll, at least a, a couple of the key pieces are. And um, I, I guess we'll see on the licensing and pricing. Well, it's a nice way to sort of embed the technology behind Teams kind of everywhere, right? So yeah. it might actually be a threat to Twilio and, and those types, you know, down mm -hmm. the road. Mm -hmm. um, right. But, but for a developer, it totally makes sense, right? You can just kind of embed it. It and does. You don't have to build it. I mean, um, they say they say a few lines of code. Who who knows what that really means, right? Because a few lines of code might be, yeah, oh, it's just like really easy, plug and play. Or it might be like, yeah, you actually have to know how to program in these things. So we'll see. That's another we'll see, I think. Yeah, well, a lot of it just comes down to the art of the API, basically. So Yeah. Yep. And Azure is also doing some resiliency things. They are. Um, so in September, at the start of September, Gartner came out with their regular cloud infrastructure magic quadrant where they talk about the cloud computing leaders and of course azure was in there but it was very interesting what they got dinged for by gartner they talked about microsoft not having enough availability zones which is kind of the way you fail over for disaster recovery and talked about some of the concerns around uh, capacity and infrastructure with azure so these announcements at ignite that microsoft's making it kind of feels like they're answering gartner's questions on this um, Microsoft's going to talk about how they're going to add more Azure availability zones to their data centers across the world. Uh, they're going to start out with a couple new ones and then build up from there. They, they first announced availability zones back in 2018, and this is where Microsoft um, has um, areas within Azure that have their own independent power source, their own independent networking and cooling, um, and they have a guaranteed service level agreement of 99.99. .99. So it's if you're somebody who needs to know that you have a guaranteed backup plan, that's a good way to go with Azure availability zones. Uh, so yeah, they're gonna talk about that at Ignite. They're gonna talk about this new service called Azure Resource Mover, which is very interesting for people who care about uh, data um, residency. It's gonna let you take multiple Azure resources and move them between regions and still maintain the idea of managing them all from a single pane of glass. And that's going to be out in public preview as of this week. Uh, they're going to talk about zone to zone disaster recovery, a new service for Azure with replication failover and backup for virtual machines in the same regions. Um, and they're also going to, this is not um, a resiliency thing so much as kind of a brand new Azure service, but they're going to talk about something called Azure Orbital, which is a service for satellite operators who want to get physical satellite communications connected to the cloud. Um, so they announced last year at Ignite this thing called Express Route for Satellite, and that was more aimed at enterprise customers who care about satellite services um, and using that in conjunction with Azure. But this is for mobile, um, uh, sorry, for satellite operators. So they're gonna be talking about that. Um, this is a direct competitor, I believe, to AWS Ground Station, which is another satellite service that uh, Amazon launched actually a couple of years ago. So they've got, they've got a lot of different Azure services and especially uh, uh, things especially focused on resiliency and proving that Azure is just as capable as AWS in the cloud uh, on deck for Ignite. 
It, it sounds like, yeah, it's a lot of meat and potatoes kind of thing. Um, I do know the data region stuff is huge. Yeah. Like there's every company is sort of trying to figure out how to work that. Um, right. And Azure has seemed slower relative to like, you know, the adding zones like, you know, AWS yeah. has and, and even Google, like Google's ramped mm -hmm. it up dramatically. So, so they might be playing a little catch up there. That's true. Yep. Uh, what's going to be new on the hybrid front? Um, you know, because I'm, I'm still sort of surprised hybrids <laughs> become as popular as it has. Yeah. Um, even more surprising is how much AWS and Google have hopped on the hybrid bandwagon and multi cloud bandwagon. Yeah. To the point where Microsoft seems to be losing some of their incumbency there. So, so I guess <laughs> what are they doing on that front? Yeah, it's it's funny to me to kind of look back and I remember when Microsoft first came out and really was touting themselves as a hybrid play cloud and how Google and AWS both were really poo pooing that like, oh, that's not real cloud, that's cloud washing, right? And now everybody wants to do hybrid because that's what customers want. So Microsoft started out in hybrid with this thing called Azure Stack, which was a bunch of server appliances from their key partners that could be used by customers or partners in their own data center and ha um, basically be running Azure services in those data centers. Since then, they've really filled out the Azure stack family. Uh, they now have a bunch of ruggedized edge device appliances that used to be branded as Azure Data Box Edge, but now they call them Azure, let's see, Azure Stack Edge. Um, and at Ignite, they're going to be talking about three new Azure Stack Edge devices. The thing to know about all of these is they're portable, they're small, um, and they let you do things in, in edge computing, you know, as they say, at the edge, uh, from storage to networking to AI processing. Like it's, it's like basically you have your own little mini data center in a box. So they have three different models, um, ruggedized in different ways with different kinds of um, GPU capabilities and power supply capabilities that they're gonna be rolling out at the show. Uh, they're also gonna talk again about Azure Arc, which was one of their biggest announcements last year at Ignite. So Azure Arc is their play where they uh, allow their IT pros to manage Azure services wherever they are. So they can be on premises, they can be in Azure, they can be in other clouds like AWS or Google. And you, can, you as the IT pro can see and manage all of these services centrally through the Azure portal. So this week they're gonna talk about how they're adding new kinds of Azure Arc enabled services to their family. They've got the window, Windows and Linux servers, Azure Arc enabled devices ready to go for production now. Uh, and they're going to be talking about Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes and Azure Arc enabled SQL Server, which are both going to be in public preview. And they're also going to introduce the idea of, uh, again of Azure Arc enabled data services. So these are things like SQL managed instance and Azure po Postgres SQL hyperscale that they're going to also allow customers to manage from their central Azure portal, even if they're deployed on other clouds or on premises. So that's going to be another big theme here. Yeah, that's, well, yeah, I mean, I've been covering a ton of edge. So, yep. you know, everybody, you know, from the, from Dell's to Qualcomm, they're all doing these edge reference designs. Yeah. And, you know, basically you're going to have these little data centers on billboards or the billboard right. poles, <laughs> and they're just going to be everywhere. Yep. And it's, it's an interesting space, but again, that's one where, you know, there's a bunch of players involved yep. with this ahead of mm -hmm. time. Yep. Um, and even the Arc thing is, I guess what's interesting about that is, you know, AWS and Google's really hopped on this where they're, they're they sort of, yep. you know, if everything's containerized, they're all sort of trying to leapfrog each other to be that one pane mm -hmm. of glass to manage everything. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I felt like when Google came out with Anthos and AWS started talking about Outposts, I'm like, oh, here they come for Azure, right? It, this is like right up Microsoft's alley. But the one thing I'm surprised they aren't announcing at Ignite um, that I know about is this thing called Azure Stack Fiji. It might be too early for this, but this is Microsoft's direct competitor to Outposts. It's basically Microsoft putting Azure in racks and giving you the hardware to run yourselves. And right now, they don't have that. They have the partner appliances through Azure Stack Hub, but they don't have the equivalent to Outposts where they actually give you the hardware. And so maybe that's, maybe that's an announcement for next year. 
Right. So obviously, you know, there's a bunch of other announcements here. Um, you know, you met, you mentioned before there was a bunch of teams announcements. Mm -hmm. I guess what's your just what's your take on how they're rolling out features there? I mean, it just seems like they're 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 just yeah. It's it's almost strange. Like I'm almost thinking these things need to be packaged up more like a I know. you know ServiceNow kind of platform or Salesforce, mm -hmm. where it's a six months cadence, three months cadence. Yeah. Instead, instead, we're getting all these little updates over and over again. So I know. I kind of I myself as a Teams user, I'm starting to feel some Teams fatigue. I have to say, like it's you know the Microsoft's idea is customers want the new features. They want them as fast as we can get them, and we're going to keep rolling them out as soon as they're ready. And Ignite, I think there's like 30 Teams announcements, and they're all fairly incremental updates. But you know, to somebody, each one of those announcements is very important, obviously. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. I think they need to be packaged up more because otherwise you just feel like I never can keep up with what's new in Teams, right? It's just feature after feature after feature. And I, I've heard from some IT pros who feel this way, not just about Teams, but about Microsoft 365 all up where they're like, I cannot keep up with all the things they're doing. Like, even if they only give it to me once a month, there's still a laundry list of like, you know, 30 new things. And it's hard to just know what's there, what isn't there yet, what's coming. Even if there's a roadmap, it's just hard to know. Is that in my client yet? Is that in my tenant yet? So I agree. I think, I think even though Microsoft wants to get these out because a, a lot of the announcements at Ignite are meant for two groups. They're meant for people working from home who need, need certain capabilities and for people who are starting to go back into the office who need a lot of no touch and voice capabilities so they're not touching all the equipment in their offices. Um, so they're good, they're good, solid announcements, but I feel like there's just too many of them. Yeah, I, I think they're going to have to get to a point where they're, they treat Teams as if it's a platform where yeah. they're actually doing, it's more like a SaaS cadence where you're kind of like, okay, mm -hmm. so, and maybe you have your choices to what to upgrade to or not, right? Which yeah. is what all yeah. the, a lot of the SaaS vendors do too. So mm -hmm. yeah, I just, I just think they're going to get their hands around it because it, it just seems yeah. like, you know, like, like when Zoom's rolling out new features, it's more, they give you like one really cool one. Yeah. Or maybe two, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, yeah. and and maybe that's even monthly, but they're not throwing the kitchen sink at you. Yeah. It almost seems like it almost seems like Microsoft is, you know, trying to show they're moving fast, almost to the so. detriment of enterprises, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I I, I mean they want to match Slack and Zoom for everything they have and surpass them. But at some point you have to say, okay, can can the users actually digest all these things you're throwing at them? Because there's so many. And just when you have your team's environment set up the way you want, oh, here comes some more things, you know? So, yeah, well, it's a lot. It, it kind of gets back to, you know, the office thing, right? Where right. office kept adding these features and yeah, it was great, yeah. but got to the point. I mean, it still is to the point, right? Where it it's, it's, yep. it's just this menu of these tiles up top and I find myself <laughs> writing a nerd notepad. I know. And hey, yes. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, it's just too much. I so know, I think teams, it is. teams risk getting that to that point. Yeah. And that's yeah. very dangerous because you kind of just want video conferencing to work. I know. Right. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a little tricky. I know. And, you know, telling people we added, you know, performance and reliability improvements, it's like snore. Nobody wants to cover that. But that's really what people want, right? That's, that's the real thing they want. Yeah. Well, especially for schools. I mean, right. school, school started and, you know, there were a bunch of problems that first day. Yep. First week, yep. really. So I know. Anything else to toss in that night we need to know about? One more thing, because you know, there's always that one more thing. Right. <laughs> um, I would say the other announcement that I think is going to get a lot of play, although I don't know really how many people will use it, is Chromium-based Edge is finally going to be available on Linux. Um, this is something Microsoft's been teasing for like I, I think about two years. Like maybe we're going to put credge on Linux. Maybe. Maybe it's going to come. Well, there's no reason it can't come. And then this week, they're going to actually say, okay, it's available now in public preview as of October. And the, the way they're positioning it is this is mostly for IT pros and developers who want to test websites. So they're not saying it's the year of desktop Linux. That's not the pitch, as you would not expect it to be for Microsoft. Um, instead, it's more like the pitch for Apple, which is this is for people who need to test the browser across platform and make sure it works everywhere. 
Yeah, I mean that is that is clearly like a developer sort of play, right? So yeah. Yeah. but but Linux is that platform for a lot of developers and mm -hmm. enterprises too, right? So right. If Chromium yeah. and Firefox is what's there. If Chrome is and Firefox is what what's there, yep. Then and if Edge is not there, you've already lost some mind share right out of the gate. Exactly. So yep. yeah, I, I yep. guess it makes sense, but yeah, it affects probably I don't know, hundred people, if I'm just guessing. <laughs> Um, it's not much, right? It's not, not yeah. like, not like somebody's mom's going to come home and go, Ooh, wow, they have edge on Linux now. <laughs> you know, work. it's, it was like the last checkbox they had. It's everywhere else. It's on windows seven, windows eight, one. It's on all the different flavors of everything. And then you're like, except Linux, right? <laughs> right. So, all right, good stuff. And right. we'll look forward to your coverage. Thank you, Larry. Thanks.